This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. And NetSuite from Oracle, the last business system you'll ever need. To get your free guide, How to Overcome the Five Obstacles to Successful Growth, go to netsuite.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. And today on the program, we are going to go full science fiction on you. You may remember the amazing film, Minority Report. I had Kevin Kelly on the program recently, and he discussed his consulting on that very film, which got a lot of things right about the future. And one of the things he got right was that, hey, at some point, we may be using our hands to make gestures in the air and control what's happening on the screen. Well, the company that is at the forefront of this revolution, and they've been grinding it out, trying to figure this out for a little while now, is Leap Motion, and they're making great progress, and you're gonna see a demo of it in just a minute if you're watching on video. If you're not watching on video, you can go to thisweekinstartups.com and you can watch it, or go to youtube.com slash thisweekin, and you'll see the actual video of me playing with Leap Motion's latest products. The uh, company has raised $50 million and uh, includes investors like Bill Warner, Founders Fund, which is Peter Thiel's fund, and Brian Singerman, Cyan Bannister, a bunch of focus over there, Luke Nossett, uh, and then uh, Andreessen Horowitz, the famous uh, Andreessen Horowitz, also an investor. And we have the CEO and co-founder, Michael Buckwald here. Welcome to the program. Yeah, it's great to be here. How long have you been working on Leap Motion? A very long time. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a very hard problem. And to do it right, you have to be able to track hounds in exactly all the ways that we use our hounds in the real world. So it's it's truly been a you know seven or eight year journey. Seven uh, or eight years. And I mean the we we first moved out here and, and raised our our first seed round back in twenty eleven. In twenty eleven. So yes. you've been grinding it out. And I remember seeing the product two or three years ago. I guess that little first product came out. Uh, was that right about then? You are you are right. Uh, so, the the first product that came out was for desktops and PCs, mm. uh, and had this. The, the mission has always been the same uh, in terms of using fingers and hands to try to address the fact that even though we have these unbelievably powerful computers, um, and and right now a thermostat is as powerful as you know hundred thousand servers might have been thirty years ago. Um, input has only gone from various states of binary, like you're pushing a keyboard, clicking a mouse, touching a touchscreen. Uh, so it's like a tiny grain of sound. Yeah. And uh, but because everyone in the world knows uh, instantly how to use their hands and fingers to do very complicated things, the mission's always been about bringing that experience um, into into computers so people can reach in and touch things. Um, but that's, but but doing it, making it exactly like real life is is a very hard problem. And when you do this, so people at home can get an idea, you're kind of waving your hands in the air in the proximity of your computer to activate things on your screen. So just like in Minority Report, if you were to stick your finger out, you could click on something in the air, uh, or if you were to pinch and zoom, you might be able to open something up or zoom in on it. Correct. Yeah. So it's it's about using the movements of your fingers and hands in in space, um, like you see in movies, uh, like Minor Airport yep. um, or Iron Man, and it's about using those movements to do things on a computer. Right. Uh, and in in particular, we really focus on things that are natural and where there's some sort of physical metaphor, like you see a button, and as your finger pushes forward, the button pushes in. Mm -hmm. uh, which is different than, for example, a sort of sign language gesture that a user might have to memorize and would have to learn sign language to use, right. which is much easier technically, uh, because you basically, all you have to know as a computer then is, do I see the, the person making a peace sign? Hmm. Uh, whereas here you have to track the fingers everywhere they are, and we move our hands so fast, and so, uh, an intelligent person might say, if you can see someone's fingers with a camera, it, they should be easy to track, but it's actually a, it's a really, really hard problem. Hmm. And you don't have to wear gloves. You don't have to have sensors on your hands. This is for your native 
just clean, empty hands. It yes. might be dirty, actually, <laughs> but just just your hands. There's no gloves involved, so people are clear. Right. How, however, your hands are um, cleaner, cleaner, dirty. Um, yeah. But but your own hands without any gloves or sensors, huh. uh, because that's uh, asking people to wear gloves is bizarre. It is. It's bizarre, and it's it, and, and part of even though the technology that is underneath this is is very sophisticated. The goal is actually about that being invisible. That's and right. it's about making computing more accessible to regular people. And I, gloves would be antithetical to that. Um, it's it's easier to ask a um, like seven year old grandmother to use her hands the same way she has been her whole life with a computer, but it's harder to ask her to put on crazy giant gloves um, to do the same. So what we'll get into the demo in just a second. My question for you is, why hasn't this come to, say, a television set? I have, like, this, you know, recent Samsung, and, you know, they put some really interesting voice into it. Uh, the Apple has a little bit of voice now. I have the new Apple TV. You can, it's got Siri, obviously. And I've always wanted to be able to just, like a Jedi Knight, be able to just move mm. to the next channel or fast forward. It seems to me like television... Uh, and being able to control media would be the obvious huge win for that. Have you guys thought about that and maybe building this into other people's television sets? And is that coming soon or ever? Yeah, we we definitely always want to to embed and build in the technology. So we we've made those first products because we felt like we had to be bold and had to kind of um, we had to make a point and impact in the market um, to get people's attention. Um, and, and manufacturers, uh, we we think a lot about what spaces we want to target, um, like TV. Um, and I, I think TVs, it was actually one of the spaces that we put a lot of thought into um, when we were deciding between, say, that or virtual reality or augmented reality. And um, it definitely has a lot of favorable things to it. And, the, and you're right that right now it is... Almost everyone has a giant TV in their living room, yeah. and it's this massive screen, but it's it's totally dumb. And yeah. we, we miss a lot of opportunities to use it as a real computing device, certainly. Uh, but I think for us, at the same time, there was this question of, well, we could pursue a market like TV where there are billions of TVs already, um, or but, it, but where the platform exists, um, or we could be, take a little bit more of a risk and target something like VR or AR, where... The, plot, the rules of the platform are being written in real time and where we can sort of be a part of hopefully determining like what is the operating system and what is the product just from a basic expectation level um, at, at an early level. Now, when I use my Oculus Rift, and I see we have an Oculus Rift here, is that right? Um, when I use mine at home, it has these little cameras that kind of know that I have the controllers in my hand and that's how my hands work, right? You have to use controllers. Is the idea uh, with your product that I don't need those controllers in my hands anymore? Yeah, ex exactly. So for, for the first generation of VR, things like Oculus Rift and, and HTC Vive, for, for those, you have cameras and they track a controller. And the controller, um, it, it's interesting, but it, but it doesn't actually, it doesn't feel like your hands. Uh, it feels more like playing like a, a claw game um, yeah. in, a, in an arcade where you push a button and then the claw comes down. Yeah. Uh, and that no one loves that. Uh, and I think the, the, the fundamental premise of VR, which hasn't been met yet, which I think is why the sales have been underwhelming, is, is that you when you put on that headset, you should feel like you're being magically transported to a different world. Yeah. And when you're trying to figure out how you use this controller, especially if you're using it for the first time, that is the opposite of holy shit, I see my hands, right. and I, I feel like I'm actually here. Got so. it. So that's what you guys bring to the table. Oculus and HTV, HTC Vive have not actually built any technology to do that yet. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, the, 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 the downside of this being such a hard problem is that it's taken us you know, seven years and, and, many, and tens of millions of dollars and um, about, you know, uh, and, and of... You know, almost a decade of our lives. Um, but the good part is that it, because it's so hard and because it takes so long, um, we are still the only people in the world who have technology that's sort of even remotely at the level needed to track fingers and hands for the sort of direct input. 
Uh. And this is why in movies, when they do motion capture, they put those ping pong balls mm -hmm. all over the suit. Because as good as computer vision technology has gotten in the last decade, enabling self-driving cars and all kinds mm -hmm. of interesting things, facial recognition, actually knowing where the body is in space, let alone where your digits are in space, your fingers are in space, that is too hard for computer vision today, or we're, we're kind of getting there? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard, and you can try to brute force it um, with lots of power. Um, and even, even sort of the state of the art with servers that, uh, you know, computer graphic researchers are working on, it still doesn't quite get you there, because it's not just about tracking fingers that you can see, for example, which you could brute force, but so many of the ways I use my hands involve my fingers being hidden, like the way even simple things like grabbing this cup. If you're yeah, you're holding one of those trademark yeah. this being startups cups. Yes, and you're yes, which is this beautiful cup. But uh, you know, I as a device as a user, I expect that the device knows what's happening with these fingers because I certainly do as right. a user, even though the sensor can't see anything that's happening. So right. it, it still has to know though. It's blocking your palm. It might be blocking one or two fingers depending on the angle. Yeah, and the computer has to figure all that out. Right, and, and that's, software. that's one of many th things that make it very hard. Why is it in that motion capture? Because it, it feels like you're, am I correct in saying that motion capture is the sort of predecessor to what you're doing? Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a predecessor uh, uh, to, to a certain extent in the sense that, it's, that it tries to track you know, hands and bodies. I would say you know, one is more oriented towards in, s industrial use cases versus as, a, as an input device. But when, you, when you look at that motion capture, why is it that they have to have people in a black, dark, skin-tight mm -hmm. suit with a bunch of mm -hmm. ping-pong balls all over them to, in order to pull it in instead of just, okay, uh, we're just going to simply set this up so that people can just move on camera? Like, shouldn't they just be able to, at this point, capture a person moving around mm -hmm. and then superimpose something? Why do they need all this black suit with the dots on it. When you see the Planet of the Apes, you know, that famous guy who played Gollum and, Pla and Cornelius, I guess. Was it Cornelius or Caesar? You see the Planet of the Apes? You see that new one? No. It's, you it's, haven't seen the new Planet it, of the Apes? It's, is, it, is, it, is it as bad as it, as it sounds? It's extraordinarily good. I have to say the new three-part series is extraordinarily mm -hmm. good. You're not a sci-fi guy. I, I'm shocked. No, no, we we are we're sci-fi. Yeah. All right, yeah. listen. This is what this is your homework for yep. a long weekend. You got the long Memorial that's, Day that's weekend. True. You got to you got to watch these uh, three films. Incredible, actually. But the the thing that's most incredible about it is the guy who plays. I, I'll have Emmy Water Ring producer Jackie tell me his name. He re really deserves recognition because he did not only Gollum in the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. He also did. Um, Caesar in this film, and man, they, they, I think he's going to get nominated f uh, for his motion capture performance. But it's just bizarre to me that they can, they can't get any of our bodies and just superimpose them. How how soon before that you think? How close are Andy uh, Circus? Yeah, that's his name. He, uh, Andy Circus. How soon before that where they can just, you know, your iPhone would, you hold it up and you'd be able to turn me into a monkey and watch me jump around like a monkey. Uh, so I suppose you're just imagining I'm a monkey right now. Yes, I'd, I'd say if you're standing still, yeah. or if it's the room but not you, then then pretty close, like now perhaps. But if you're moving, and depending on how you're moving, uh, which I guess is part of it. So if you move exactly the right way, um, then you know as people often do when someone's making a demo to show off how cool the technology is, then it's okay. But um, if you're but it, given the unpredictable nature of movement, um, and if you want to track you know, things where there's occlusion um, and, and other things, that's that's hard. Um, you know, but I, but I think that there's a second trend in VR as well um, in terms of mobile VR, um, where the input is even more terrible um, in terms of things like the Gear VR, where right now input is mostly just kind of using your head as a mouse cursor and tapping. Uh, yeah, but that's I've, not a great experience. You're talking about the uh, Gear VR stuff. Yeah, what well, do they call that kind of VR? Uh, well, so it's there's there 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 are two types of mobile VR. Some people are building standalone devices that have Got their it. own processor, and then others are slot-ins where you slot your phone in. Is a slot-in good experience or no? 
Well, it can it can be a good experience. I think the the part that I mean, it has the ability to be cheap, and the display in the cell phone is is really good. In some ways, it's 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 comparable to the display that's in an Oculus these days. But um, the thing that's missing is input, and you can't even have a controller on a plane. You can't like set up your tracker dots. Yeah. Um, but you always have your hands with you. Hmm. All right, so let's take a quick break. When we come back from break, Michael and his team are going to demo for me and you the new Leap Motion software with VR headsets when we get back on This Week in Startups. I want to first thank my friend Scott Walker for supporting startups, not just supporting This Week in Startups, but startups themselves. Walker Corporate Law, as you know, is a boutique law firm that specializes in the representation of entrepreneurs and startups. That's what they do. And they encourage fixed fees. What's that? They give you a fixed price. You know what you're going to pay to do your startup financing, to do your corporate formation, to do your trademarks, to do whatever you need to do, employee stock option plan, licensing, mergers, acquisitions, terms of service, privacy policy, all those things that are check boxes for your startup. They do uh, with lawyers that have decades of experience, 10, 20 years, no junior associates, getting on the job training, and they specialize in startups. That's why they're so good at it. That's why they can give you fixed fees, and they're really in it for the right reason. Scott Walker comes to all of our events. He's a real true mensch, and he spends a lot of time talking to founders, and you can call him directly right now, 415-979-9998. 415, that's San Francisco, 979-9998. Or you can email him, scott at walkercorporatelaw.com, scott at walkercorporatelaw.com, or visit walkercorporatelaw.com. Scott's a great guy. Tell him your Uncle Jason sent you, and he'll take care of you. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I am in virtual reality now using Leap Motion's new hand detection in VR, and it is the most wonderful, insane thing I've ever seen. I did not get uh, any instruction on how to do this. I simply put my handset on, my headset on, and I started looking around this beautiful world in space. When I opened my hand, I noticed when my palm was out, three different sizes, and I immediately picked the rectangle. And then I realized when I had my hands together that it lit up, and if I put my hands together, I could pinch and make rectangles, and that they would drop just like this. And then I am sitting here with my friend from, oh, look at gravity, it's a little weird right now, but I'm sitting here with my friend. Tell me your name. Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca. Uh, and so, Rebecca, we lost gravity. What happened? Okay, so, you must have, so the way that you turn gravity on and off in this world is that you, you place your palms facing up, and then you raise your hands all the way up. And then to turn it off, you turn your palms the other way, and you press them down very quickly. It's a very quick movement. drop these and I make these. Oh no, they're still dropping. I think you control gravity this time. So I am not able. Whoa, everything's falling from the sky. Beautiful. So now, um, I'm sorry, tell me your name again. I'm so distracted. Rebecca. Uh, what do you do at Leap Motion? I'm the chief of staff at Leap Motion. Okay. I'm the chief of staff at Leap Motion. So we got into our Oculus headset, and normally when I'm doing this at home on my Oculus, I have to have the controllers, correct? Correct. Or you can't, I mean, this, this uh, demo that we are in currently is one that you can do on your Oculus or on your Vive, um, and it is solely based on, you, you must have a Leap controller in order to be in this experience. And I have to tell you, you know, uh, Rebecca, this is um, something I've never experienced in uh, VR, you do see your hands, but I've never had this level of control. The fidelity is incredible. That's correct. And so one way you can really notice the fidelity, Jason, is if um, if we turn gravity back on and we create a little block, and I then t tap it to you, I can make a very, very yes, and we can like play. It's very easy to just simply tap, slowly tap a block and pass it back and forth, and that is very difficult to do. <laughs> or you can make create lots of blocks. Of I can make a bunch of them really fast. And then you can uh, bounce them around, and then we can turn gravity off. That's correct. Up, off. Oh, there you go. You know how to do it. Wow, it's really like being a Jedi. And then I noticed if I put my hand up, we can do a high five. We can do a high five. 
That is so cool. To sort of, sorry, I'm not speaking into the mic, um, to talk a bit about how we think about this technology. The um, interface that you described when you first started talking is a virtual wearable interface. Um, and this is something that is great for this demo, but it's also great if you think about, you know, in the future when we all ha are in augmented reality, this is where we'll be able to, you know, tap our phone, tap our contacts, tap for our email, bring up a keyboard, you know, do whatever you want. This has many more applications beyond this app this demo. Um, and then in terms of being able to create different shapes, this is showcasing exactly what Leap Motion's direct mission is, to have direct physical interactions with digital objects. And you can see when you interact with these digital objects, you can pick them up, you can poke them, you can, you know, flick them around, you can kind of do whatever, and they interact like real objects. Um, and that's thanks to uh, the physics engine that our team has built specifically for this demo. Um, the other thing that I, I like to talk about, and Michael talked a bit about this earlier, was your hands feel, your virtual hands feel like your real hands in this demo because they're in the same place as your real hands and they interact just like your regular hands. And that that's, goes back to that fidelity that you were talking about. Right. Now, one thing where it's a little bit limited, and I guess you have a little bit of work to do, is when I my fingers touch each other, right? It Well, actually, it's pretty interesting. I'm interweaving my fingers, and it's actually working, which is kind of interesting. Um, I can actually... Similar to what Michael was saying earlier, when it comes to occlusion, it's difficult for the technology to sense. You know, if you're when you're if you clench your fist, for instance, you can see that it has a pretty good does a pretty good job with that. But if you um, cross your hands, for instance, then you often find that you lose one of your hands because it's difficult for the sensor to tell. Uh, the one thing we want to support that isn't officially ready. Um, is actually being able to touch your physical, say, arm with your hand. Um, and at that point, the menu, instead of popping off of your hand into virtual space, could actually be on your arm, so that then you can get the sensation of actually physically touching your arm. Um, but I think, but for now, uh, you, the, the idea is, is definitely to create this sense of connection to technology that 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 feels magical. And I, I think the reason people feel magic from this, even if it's just moving blocks around, is is that the potential um, that comes from that sense of connectivity to computers is is very it's it's massive. And uh, uh, you you can think for example about things that you can only do with fingers, like trans transforming learning by making it so the same way that we as children for the rest of our lives understand all the permutations of what will happen if we throw a basketball through the air. Um, we can't hold hands. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. would be the really sweet thing, is so we could hold hands. <laughs> yeah. We, we can't shake hands or hold hands yet, but it feels like we're pretty close to being able to tickle each other. <laughs> um, so being able to play basketball in this space and actually throw a free throw would be pretty amazing. Oh, sorry, Jackie. I keep hitting Jackie with the microphone. I'm sorry, yeah. Jackie. Uh, but, Emmy award-winning producer yeah. Jackie's going to get a black eye. Uh, uh, sorry, but, Jackie. But, but if you also, I think if you imagine uh, you know, how every single person in the world knows exactly the physics of throwing a basketball because they did it once or twice as a child. Um, so we have this ability to learn that comes from our hands that is different than how we learn things abstractly. Um, and, you know, Tony Hawk is an amazing skateboarder, not because he knows the equations best, because he has this also, this intuitive understanding. Um, but we can only learn that in re real life about things we can grab like balls, but not like the sun or quantum particles. Um, but in VR, you, you can do that. Um, you know what's super fascinating about this is it feels to me like my mind is completely tricked. So I have an itch on my nose here. My mind feels so tricked right now that I feel like this is the real world because when your hands are this, when the fidelity on your hands is this good, like I'm touching my fingers, each one, when the fidelity is this good, I mean, I'm moving very fastly, touching my pinky and my thumb together and then doing each finger. Um, it's triggering the, the menu. But when I'm doing it, it feels so real that my brain is being tricked into thinking that I'm really in uh, the real world, when in fact I'm in obviously in virtual reality. Yeah, and, and a lot of people 
they ask if you need a sort of haptics, like if you if you need to feel that you're touching something. But um, you know, we find that that most people actually um, that the brain is tricked into providing a, almost a little bit of insensation um, of touch. Uh, oh, that's interesting. So when I hit it and I throw it or I knock it away, um, it actually knows. Yeah, this is truly amazing. I have to say, this is just the fidelity is incredible. So this is the literally the first demo that you guys have done. This is, is that right? This is this is one of the first demos. Although, uh, you know, now that now we've basically taken that same a uh, little device you referenced at the beginning of the show, uh, yeah. the, the 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 peripheral, and we've made it so as you can see because you're wearing it now, so that yeah. people can mount it on a headset, oh. and. Um, with this is just basically software upgrades, so anyone can for free download this software, which is you know, four generations later than the the one that came out several years ago. Um, and of course, we're we're also working with OEMs that are making VR and AR devices to embed this as the as a control mechanism as well. So then, different people will be incorporating your software into their system. Yep, yeah, absolutely. The, the goal. The goal is to be so ubiquitous that there's no need to have a peripheral. Um, and so when will this uh, actually have the um, ability to have an application that I might use at work or like something that's more than just a really slick demo, like a, a killer app? Do you have a killer game for this? Yeah, th there will be the killer apps will be things like games, but also well, one of the reasons we chose VR and AR is is we think that the hands are also just the primary input. So, you know, users will use this to load things on the operating system. They'll use it, uh, especially if you if you think about something like augmented reality, where you know the 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 sort of holy grail or something that's like a tiny pair of glasses that can project physically indistinguishable things around you on top of anything that you could look just like a TV or an object. And, and obviously, because the whole point of air is that you can see through it and look at your hands, you'll, you can't really imagine anything being the primary input for air except hands. So there are, there are a lot of um, demos and developers who are already using this to build things like gamifying stroke rehabilitation or controlling robots on the other side of the world. Um, or, uh, for example, the Australian government is using this for its mandatory training for coal miners. Um, but as a consumer product, we, we really we, we want to make it the primary input. Um, not, not necessarily the only one. There are other things that are valuable as well. Um, like voice might be better for text input than using your hands. But... Uh, but I think nothing can replace the sense of connection and presence you get with fingers and hands. So we're just Rebecca and I are just going to sit here and play with blocks like we're four-year-olds. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Playing with blocks is something I guess I haven't done since I was a child, and I'm going to start crying here. I miss <laughs> playing with blocks with another child. Um, wow, this it, it really is like nothing I've ever experienced. I have to say, like you know, I've done all the different systems out there. And this is definitely takes it to a whole nother level of, like I said before, fidelity and the the feeling of grabbing something in here without having the controller truly changes things. I think your point about you know you grown ups playing with blocks sort of speaks to how we we have taken because of the lack of input with computers uh, the way we as software designers make up for that are by drop down menus and keyboard shortcuts and. Things that make things that we as humans should find fun and joyful, like creation, um, you know, annoying and 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 sort of unhuman. Yeah, you know what we should do? Um, we should talk to Elon if he can just put some robots on Mars uh -huh. or the Moon. Actually, would be even better if we had robots on the Moon right now, which I think we could reach. He could reach there. Um, if Elon can put some robots on the Moon, how much would you pay per hour? have the experience of what we're doing right now, walking around the moon with a robot that was literally picking up moon rocks and playing with them. Like, we'll never in our, ex our lifetime experience playing with stuff on the moon, but you could create a, a version of the moon 
um, with robots and control them. And in fact, this would be an interesting, I mean, I hate to bring it back to weapons, but <laughs> if you could give us some guns here <laughs> and give us some robotics, <laughs> we could literally send, uh, and I know this sounds farcical, but we could literally send little tanks that we control in virtual space here with our hands into combat without ever putting ourselves at risk and just absolutely murder people. This is what you had in mind with the technology, correct? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm absolutely making murdering. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you know, the, the, as soon as you get to a robot that has fingers that can move like a human, then really anything that humans can do become possible through that virtual space. Also size. When you think about it in terms of size, if this was a giant crane and we could be manipulating a giant crane that was picking up huge boulders on you know somewhere that's dangerous the bottom of the ocean or whatever we could literally be on the bottom of the ocean right now doing exploration in virtual space in a classroom um or in a volcano or other places where like humans really shouldn't be hanging out all right this has been amazing i think we'll stop you know we'll give a high five for sure maybe give a couple high fives because that was just felt so good. We could just pow, pound it out. You'd have no fist bump in here. Tremendously disappointing. Uh, oh, I think you can. oh, I do have a uh, fist bump. All right, I feel much better about it now. All right, when we come back on this week in Startups, we're going to talk about where all this technology is leading and when consumers will have their hands on it and how developers can start playing with it. Stick with us. I'm going to take off the ridiculously looking headset after the break. Hey, everybody. I want to welcome NetSuite as a new partner here at This Week in Startups. And if you're listening to this, you're probably a business owner and a leader, and you probably have said one of the following to yourself, why is it taking accounting so long to close the books? And we beat our revenue goal, but we lost money. Why? And the dreaded, we're getting audited. Yes, all of these things are a sign that you've outgrown your business management software. Or maybe you're not even using any software. QuickBooks and spreadsheets work fine at the start of a company. Of course, we all do that. But now there's too many mistakes and delays, and you can't get answers fast. So you need the number one business management solution for growing companies. That is NetSuite from Oracle. NetSuite from Oracle is going to solve all these problems. You're going to know what's going on in your business in real time. Revenue, expenses, customers, orders, even your HR department, everything in a gorgeous dashboard, on your phone even. And their current clients include people you know, like GitHub, local analytics, local analytics rather, plan grid, and 88% of Bessemer's next cloud unicorns are using NetSuite by Oracle. You're up and running fast, and it's the last business system you're ever going to need. So here's your call to action. Very simple, go to netsuite.com slash twist, and you will get your free guide. That guide is called Overcoming Your Five Obstacles for Growth. Okay. And let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and I am in a VR haze. Whenever you take those headsets off, do you ever have that jarring moment, mm. Michael? Yeah, it, it's, it's it's kind of like you don't necessarily want to be in the real world, and you want to go back. It's really a weird experience. The fidelity of uh, your product combined with how great the Oculus mm. has gotten in recent years Whenever I take off a pair of VR goggles now, I feel like there needs to be like a 30 seconds transition mm -hmm. period where in the software, it says now taking you out of virtual reality and slow and shows you like 5% of the real world through the goggles, 10%, 15% slowly brings you back because you take them off and all of a sudden it, your mind has to take a second. It feels like you've been dropped out of a, a you know uh, an airplane or something. What I was struck by there is just how smooth it was and how intuitive it was. Uh, it's taken you a long time to get there. Mm -hmm. um, how, what, what's left to get done for you? What, I mean, we talked a little bit about you know, that when the hands are interacting with each other, that's a really hard problem, huh? When you interlace your fingers, I noticed if I interlaced my fingers slowly, it kind of got it right. But when I started jarbling my fingers all together very quickly, it was, it was a little bit uh, confused. Is, is that like a problem we can never solve, or is it close? No, it's, it's close to being solved. And yeah. um, you know, the way we prioritize which things to solve are kind of based on how important that action is for a user. Okay. Uh, so something that's very hard, like grabbing, um, like as you would grab a cup, that's something that's very important. Uh, sure. And... 
interlacing in the way it did work, like this, more likely, yeah. doing this. Fidgeting it, like a maniac. Uh, it, it's something, it shouldn't break, because even if you do fidget like a maniac, it's disconcerting to ever have your hands stop working once you're in this What's your mind is like those are my hands, but so so it's still that important. Is interesting, yeah. yeah, because if you do do something weird and your your finger disappears, no, it does in your brain feel like oh my god, I just lost my index finger. <laughs> it's uh, kind of like an actual loss. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I, I, I think it, I think it, it, it shows there's definitely a high burden mm -hmm. when you're when you're uh, trying to represent people's hands and create that mental link to have it really be perfectly smooth, ultra low latency, um, but also to make it j almost always good, which, which will happen soon. Um, but, but I think the, I think more of the challenges are around then taking this and making it so developers can build consistent content mm. uh, and then so it can be embedded in things. So when will we see in your mind, you've been at this for so long now, when will we see this become something that people use every day when and what will it be we, obviously gaming seems to be low-hanging fruit but there's not enough headsets out there and they're kind of expensive right now for gaming to take off in a major way is it going to be education or is it going to be industrial use where, where do you think we'll see it first yeah so uh, right now we, we see it being used in every day i would say in in uh, in a lot of niche niches that ultimately add up to reasonably sized markets like uh, in terms of not the future but say over the last year um in terms of people who are trying to use it to gamify like stroke rehabilitation or there's uh, there are startups that are working on letting surgeons in the or use like sterile environment to control computers and systems and you know, for learning um but i think right now we're we're, we're ourselves laser focused on sort of trying to define the, the, the coming platform of, of VR and error as being about hands and fingers. Mm -hmm. um, and that means we want to create a consistent set of applications that feel kind of like the iPhone for mm -hmm. VR and error, where there are a, a few different applications and uh, you know, some of them we'll build ourselves. Some we'll work with trusted developers. Um, but uh, I think at, at first we'll probably release something like a developer kit that will hopefully have a basic set of content, kind of like the first iPhone apps, um, that will hopefully inspire people. You got the calculator, you got the yeah. calendar, you exactly, got the mail, exactly. you got the crummy browser. You know, like there was a whole <laughs> suite of things that Apple put out. It was like, we know that these kind of suck and they're very basic, but we also know the developers will make things much better. These are just table stakes. And they they told the story. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and uh, as a user, you you could figure out from using the calculator app um, that this was different than any other type of phone interface. Yeah. Uh, and you also walked away with a sense of comfort that all the other apps probably would follow a similar direct metaphor. Is Which is going to become used by 10 million people a day mm. first? Not the number of units sold, because we all know those mm. numbers are a little bit kludgy. You know, I have an Oculus I've used like 10 times. What and I'm sure there's many other ones out there like that because there's really not that much out there to do with your Oculus. It's kind of dead on arrival in my mind. It's it's very impressive technology, but there's literally mm -hmm. nothing to do with mm -hmm. it, uh, or, or close to nothing, except show it to your friends for the first time, have them be impressed, and then you know go watch a movie. Um, which will have 10 million daily users first: AR glasses or VR headsets? It's it's that that's a really good question and that's why i'm asking yeah, you. <laughs> and i cuz you're smart yeah I, I the good thing is i think they they both will be much better off with hands and fingers and 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 both need it yeah. i think that ar will be a bigger market i think it will they, be a bigger market sure it, why I, I think they have i think they both have different sets of risk i think for ar uh that there's technical risk rather than product risk because obviously if you fiat that all the technology works out, then and you have a magical pair of glasses that looks somehow sexy and tiny, and but you can project anything anywhere that looks exactly like reality, um, and I can, you know, make you look like a a, a uh, like giant scary hell demon, sure, uh, and then kill you with my hands. Who told you my Burning Man? Yes. <laughs> Somebody told you my Burning Man outfit. Yeah, uh, yeah but it, it, so that you think is. 
AR is a more compelling vision for most humans on planet Earth. Well, I think AR has some AR has some sort of table stakes things like at that it, that device I described replaces the TV, it replaces projectors, it replaces phones, I would say, because it replaces TV. Explain that to people who yeah, don't understand. Yeah. A clear just clear pane glasses that look like normal glasses that are AR enabled replaces a television set. How? So I'd say that it, sort of the moment you can project something that looks like real life, then you can make a TV appear on a wall. Um, and, uh, or a, if you, a TV is kind of mundane, but you, it, what, the, something like a TV could happen initially when the content is still 2D, but um, you would hope sort of that the next step would be instead of having a TV, that the world would be your TV. And then you'd have basically, um, instead of, Having a 2D version of a TV show, you would have a 3D version of a TV show that's taking place right around you. So we're watching Game of Thrones. Yes. And uh, and the dragons come and they start burning down. No spoiler alerts, but, <laughs> you know, when the, uh, when the dragons, um, you know, in the last episode when the dragons kill Khaleesi and they rip her apart. <laughs> When that scene, I don't want to put any spoilers out there, but when Khaleesi gets eaten by her own dragons and they turn on her, I thought that was incredible. And then Jon Snow takes the dragons for himself. I thought, anyway, without spoilers, you you could be looking around in 360 mm -hmm. and just watch all the dragons rip apart mm -hmm. the Khaleesi and take her body parts in different directions mm -hmm. when they eat her. Uh, absolutely. But also, I think, even changes our concept of time and space because yeah. how we work, like you, there, no one would have to commute to work. You could just sort of project your, an office, I could, you could project me here, I could project you here. Right, so you could be sitting in your conference room, I could be sitting in my, you know, on my deck, and I would see the studio, and we could be in an even fancier studio mm. than the one here at WeWork, <laughs> it would look like we could have the greatest studio in the world, and we're just both sitting here, we would never know the difference. Exactly. It's kind of the end of days for some people, that view of the world. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it could be, it, depending on what those people do, um, do, do they become the giant obese sort of people in like Wally? Uh, yeah, exactly, floating around. May, but maybe not because they'll have they'll get so much exercise from all that vigorous hand movement. Uh, yeah, the hand movement's definitely burning. I, I felt there I burned <laughs> at least 17 calories. Get me one of those dandelion chocolate bars stat because I just burned 17 calories. I think the dandelion chocolate bar is only 600, so I'm, I'm close. Yeah. Well, I don't know how many virtual... Uh, 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 rectangles have to make to burn those calories, but it felt like a lot. Uh, so you think AR hits 10 million before VR hits 10 million, or you're trying to be magnanimous? Well, what does your gut tell you if you had to pick one? Gets there first. I think they'll both definitely get there. Um, I, I think it's mm. it's it's going to be very close. Uh, I think. Okay, so you think it's, you 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 genuinely believe it's going to be close, not just because you have relationships with both parties who are making both competing visions. I think I think that. I think that VR, even though the existing devices have failed, I think that uh, the the what's in the pipeline from OEMs that are sort of new, fresh versions of headsets that are lower cost, but will have new input, um, and also just you know markets like China, markets like where there is just a lot more integrated content, and there are things like gaming cafes. Um, and right. just lots of people. Um, Explain that a little bit to people. In China, I've been to a gaming cafe in China, quite a scene. Uh, set the stage of what, why VR could be a big deal in China in these gaming cafes. Yeah, so you, you, one of the problems with VR as it is right now, obviously, is people, for the, for the price point and the expectations, people want to use it every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not there right now. It's probably in a, I want to use this a few times a week, which mm -hmm. aligns well with um, being not having to, buy it, but being able to go to a, a cafe, um, of which there are hundreds of thousands, and yeah. using it there. There are really hundreds of thousands there, wow. There, I mean, in China, there are hundreds, every, every, just multiply any sane number by yeah. by a thousand. Yeah, um, and you, that's what it is. <laughs> it was amazing, when I saw my first one, it was 12 or 13 years ago in, I think I was in Shanghai, and they took me in a back alley, went up a back set of stairs, there were 30 people smoking, mm -hmm. Uh, in the stairwell, got through a fog of smoke, and there were two or three hundred people in what looked like an office, jammed next to each other, playing League of Legends or no, World of Warcraft at the time, I think, just for hours mm. in the middle of a Wednesday. And I think they were getting paid like farming gold and selling it 
back to the U.S., maybe through Brock Pierce's old company that would sell virtual uh, things. So you would think this next set of VR headsets that are coming down the pike, uh, pipe are going to be better, cheaper, more unique. I think they'll I think they'll be better and, and cheaper, um, but but have hands obviously. Mm-hmm. And I think that basically, I still think the question for VR is: Can you actually make someone when they put on the headset feel like they are present? Like whether that's you're on the moon, whether that's in the body of your patient, whether that's in a game. And right now, you don't feel it because of the controllers. Mm-hmm. And I think if anything, one of the mistakes that was made was releasing with an Xbox controller even before the controller that, that was they, so weird which which is which is the which is the uh, absolute opposite of a sense of presence it's figuring out how to use this you know, shitty uh, Xbox controller that no one has a instant intuition for yeah unless you've played Xbox for you know 20,000 hours like some kids have the Xbox controller is like the most odd concept in the world yeah uh, so if you throw a new person at that but they're and they're also wearing a headset and they can't even see it um it's it was bizarre you're right super bizarre that the headset started at about a thousand dollars two years ago i think when i bought mine last year it was probably 700 bucks now it's four or five hundred bucks with controllers mm. um not christmas 2017 but let's look at christmas 2018 and christmas 19 We'll assume in Christmas 2019 there'll be an AR headset. Mm. I don't know. Do you think there'll be an AR headset in 2018 for Christmas? Maybe. Maybe. There, 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 are, there, there, there are billions of dollars being spent. Uh, every major company has major efforts, but the bar is high, I think. And I, I don't think it, it has to be – consumers won't wear it if, it's, if, it's, if it looks strange and – it has to have a wide field of view, um, and it has to have. I, I think there will be one, but it probably won't be that successful. So probably more like the the uh, Halo lens or like a Hollow lens, Hollow or lens yeah, where... which is really impressive, but it's ginormous. I mean, it's it's more embarrassing to wear that than to wear like one of those orthodontist <laughs> cages that people used to wear when I was a kid that would wrap around your face at night. Um, so in 2018, what will the price of a good VR headset be, and then in 2019, what will an AR headset look like and cost? So uh, I think the, the interesting thing about VR is I think it, it is going to rapidly commoditize from a hardware perspective. Oh, really? Because I think you know, in a lot of ways what Oculus realized originally was that you could take sort of a next-generation mobile phone headset and the kind that are... They had negotiated to get ones early, but now those are the ones that are basically shipping in you know, Samsung phones and... There are already billions produced for mobile phones. And it's just the number of pixels in them or their, the refresh rate that makes them viable? Uh, it, yeah, so it's, I mean, now, now all that technology um, almost exists for phones. And mm-hmm. where some of the work had to happen and still has to happen is in software, perhaps. But once it's done, it's done. Got it. So, um, but you're going to see that just the price continue to decrease over time and quality increase. So... Um, and, and that combined with sort of things where the price can be really low, um, like $10 or $20 if it's a slot and where you use your own phone, or even if it comes with a screen, uh, you know, I, I think there are opportunities, especially in Asia, but even in the U.S. with, with things like using um, like in-game monetization um, or virtual currency, you know, selling like for 3D shovels um, yeah. <laughs> to, 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 to defray the cost. Right. Uh, Ah, so somebody will start you yeah, selling it cheap. So there's a there's three or four different ways for this to become mm. mass. What's the mass consumption price? If you had to pick a number at Christmas for it to just sell like gangbusters, where does it have to start to hit to be a mass market device? Uh, well, I think it I think it depends on the experience um, as much as the price. But I think I think assuming that the experience feels magical and it it achieves that sense of presence that people want and maybe there's not that much content because there's just not that much time but for the content that is there when you use it you actually feel like you're in another place yeah um i would say it could it could probably be between you know i think it could be in the in the 300 400 range but okay so that seems very doable to hit that i think so that's the cost of a cheap android phone and Mm. not quite an iphone but so somewhere between the cost of a, a, a wearable watch, like a Fitbit or 
an i an Apple phone, an yeah. Apple Watch, yeah. and then half the price of an iPhone. And yeah, and I and I don't think that's cheap Android. Phone. And I think it has to get cheaper and and better and more ubiquitous to get to hundreds of millions. But I think to in at a ten million scale, I think that's yeah. possible. Ten million seems to me using it every day mm. means that a reasonable app developer could say, hey, if I have a hit mm. and I get to 10 to 20% penetration with a Call of Duty, you know, or I don't know what the other big ones have been on platform games, Angry Birds. Like, mm. I'm not sure the percentage of Angry Birds <laughs> downloads <laughs> to number of phones, yes. but it was definitely double digits. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe 50% of people who had mm-hmm. an yeah. iPad had Angry Birds mm-hmm. or at some point or mm-hmm. a third. But even if you get just 10%, you got a million people. And it feels to me like the games in VR... Right now, I when I bought games in VR, it was fifty bucks a game, sixty bucks a game. That seems ridiculous. And then I played some of these games. I really didn't get much value out of them. I played them for an hour. Yeah, and I think that for games, the the threshold is higher in terms of the content, and also for for immersion. Um, but I think there's also uh, you, basically the threshold as a developer is higher. Um, but I think there is also a second category, which are just sort of general computing experiences, like having a bunch of browsers, perhaps, that are around you like this, that you move around. Mm. Um, and I think that if you just think of it also as a as a new type of computer or a new type of phone that happens to be 3D, mm. that you use your hands or, to interact with, then there's also room for more like indie developers. Um, since for a game, for VR, you have to render like an incredible world, and it, 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 it's, it's a big endeavor, and mm. it's very costly, but... Um, for something like trying to create a you new, know, what whatever the how, how, whatever a like educational tool for uh, like preschool children is in this new spatial computing platform, that's something that Joe Developer could do with the yeah. right tools. Yeah, that seems to me to be fascinating. I would love to have the ability. My my oldest daughter is so enamored with bugs mm. and animals that I would love to have the ability for us to put on glasses, AR glasses, hopefully. And literally when she says, what's a millipede, centipede, what's the difference? I'd be able to just pull out a centipede and millipede and just turn my hands over and have one in each hand crawling all over me. And then we would be able to pick them up and then maybe we could put them to sleep and dissect them and take them apart without actually... Because when I was a kid, I don't know if that you had this experience, but when I was at Severian High School in uh, Brooklyn, New York, in Bay Ridge, we dissected a frog. Mm. Did you have to dissect a frog in high school? Oh, we we did, yeah. and it would be much better to dissect it virtually. It was the, one of the grossest experiences of my life. Like literally, they gave thirty boys a frog each. We cut them open and took each body part out, and then it was like a big game to see who would have flies or worms <laughs> or whatever in the stomachs. So it was like everybody got to open the stomach, but. You could really be doing, I, I think one of the fascinating things here is on an education basis, whoever does the Khan Academy of mm. VR or AR, where you and I would never in our lives be able to experience brain surgery yeah. or open heart surgery, mm-hmm. hopefully we'd never, <laughs> we would be unconscious yeah, if we did experience no. <laughs> it, but actually performing it. Mm. So to be able to sit there and with a doctor who's performing it, mm. watch a doctor perform it or you know, be in the room of it, or just do it yourself on a a, a, a virtual cada- cadaver. Like that would be one of the most miraculous learning experiences ever, right? I, no, le- learning is a learning is a massive use case, and I, I think it'll be interesting to see how people's brains are changed, mm-hmm. hopefully in good ways, by the way that they learn in this way. Certainly, kids growing up will. It like, will change like, your br- your brain for sure. Yeah, um, uh, uh, hopefully for the better. But but I think uh, I, I am especially excited about kids who grow up with with this from day zero because mm-hmm. if if like a regular adult can figure it out in seconds, then children who have spent their whole lives using it will be capable of you know unfathomable things. I think. Yeah, it would be amazing. Like they literally would show up at you know some landmark in the world. They would they would be at the Louvre. Mm. And they'd be like, when they physically get to the Louvre, they'd be like, I've been to the Louvre yeah. for 50 hours before. I know exactly where I'm going. I'm going to go see Venus de Milo. I'm going to go see Mona Lisa. I'm going to go see this statue. And I've already been there, so I know exactly how to walk around the place. It's, in a way, it, I guess in a way, it kind of ruins going somewhere for the first time. But in another way, it, so many more people would get to experience that. That makes up for it. Exactly. I mean, even, even people even people who have the money don't have the time to go everywhere in right. the world. Uh, and... That's definitely 
there are there are, there there are things that you want to be present at because you can't be like going like the moon or or mm. the inside of a body or a surgery yeah and then even just the world um, I mean no one you're unless you live forever yeah. um, uh, you're you're not going you can't physically experience the whole world but you could in virtual reality. I mean it's kind of interesting when you think about it. if we were able to upload our consciousness. Mm which feels like we're not going to get to do, but that our kids or their kids might get to do. You believe that? Uploading, singularity, uploading our consciousness to some cloud? Probably. Uh, two or three years, two or three generations from now. And then will your consciousness take the form of a, like an augmented reality? Uh, or will you be in the virtual reality It would be yeah. fascinating. You could li literally be in, an, you could go visit. Mm. Instead of visiting a graveyard, you could literally visit heaven in the simulation Mm. And see all your ancestors. Uh, or, 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 I mean, if you can be created in the virtual space, then, I mean, it even, it, it, it gets to sort of the question of what is you philosophically? You know, if you're, if, if you're, if you exist mm. exactly as your consciousness in a virtual world, is that you? Or, especially if you made a copy of me. Yeah. Then would it be me? Yes. And then as an experience, it, as it got jealous that it was not in the real world and there were some limitations. <laughs> It would probably hate me. Uh, yeah. I would hate me. Uh, and then, well, I kind of, yeah, so it takes self-loathing to a whole new level. Well, then, then game developers can use you, and they can put you in a game and have people, like, punch you and stuff. Yeah, so. all kinds of weird <laughs> stuff is going to happen. Hey, let me ask you a question, founder to founder. You've raised close to $100 million in six rounds of funding. You've been doing it for eight years. How does one sell as a founder mm -hmm. a 10-year journey before product market fit, right? It's, it's a long, arduous process to do what you're doing, which is just a, a large amount of base level research and platform building. How, how do you, did you raise the money? It, it was hard. It um, was hard. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you, the, the very first demo we had was my co-founder and I had probably three backpacks and a bunch of uh, like duct taped together black plastic LEDs. Mm -hmm. And but we did have the benefit of something, and it could track one finger really accurately and very fast. Uh, but I think the thing that's helped was both raise money, but also keep us focused and, and alive during sort of all the ups and downs, and also when it hasn't been clear what the market is going to be, but believing that inevitably there will be something is, is I guess, just a focus on uh, a problem that I think everyone universally can understand, which is, the, the gap we were talking about between the power and capability of computers and input um, as it is now, and whether it takes one year or two years, because maybe uh, serendipitously a new platform comes along, or uh, if it takes five years or seven years or eight years, um, eventually it has to happen. Um, uh, if you have any sort of optimism about the world. Um, and of course, I guess... In, in our case, we had the privilege sort of along the way of, of being able to try to accelerate it, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, and make it part of the conversation. But uh, it's been, I think, selling that vision combined with the the sense of having some people who are a lot smarter than me, um, who, who um, are some of the smartest scientists and researchers in the world. Um, that sort of makes you super credible the world is coming, mm. why not us? Mm. If I'm hearing correctly, if I'm paraphrasing, like this is going to happen. Somebody will build this. It might as well be us because we're the most qualified and passionate about it. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things, it's one of those inevitabilities that is so in front of everyone mm. that you don't, and, I, and you use your hands so often, but you don't really, you don't think about it. Yeah. Uh, but when you explain it to someone in the right terms, it, it does feel inevitable. Mm. And, that's not to say that there were not hundreds of times where we failures seemed certain, um, and um, you know, every I, I would even hesitate to say that like now there's there's not any danger. Um, yeah, but uh, you know th there are constant ups and downs. But uh, but we you know we we have but we have an opportunity um, to I think build something that can be a, a great business, um, but also can change the world hopefully. When does revenue kick in? I know you guys had some little developer kits out there, but I'm, I'm assuming that was a small amount of revenue for those. Mm. You probably break even on them, in fact, because it's a lot of hardware, right? Uh, yeah, so you know, the, the hardware in some cases has always been simple. So 
Um, we, we made a little bit of money on those, but that, that was never the primary business model, the, it, which it's, it's always been about embedding. And you know, along the way, we've seen revenue from special partnerships with specific companies mm -hmm. to explore different areas and such um, on the industrial side, perhaps. But, yeah. um, but the, the major revenue will come as we get embedded in these sort of upcoming devices. Yeah. So um, over the years, we've been fortunate to talk to everyone really in every space um, in every company and that gives us a lot of visibility because I, I think everyone understands that hands play some role in yeah. the future uh, and it gives us, an, it gives us a, a unique perspective uh, and I guess also another challenge but also an, an awesome opportunity is that uh, the idea of using your hands to control things is not a national or cultural or Western cultural phenomena. It's right. it's global, and you know, even without ever having a word of of say Chinese or Japanese on our site from the moment we launched, um, that was like fifty percent of our developers and pre-orders. Um, because just the idea of a video of someone using their hands, it's, it's universal. It is totally universal. Uh, hey, um, let's end on this. Apple released something called AR Kit. Mm. People have been making some pretty amazing AR demos. I'm sure you've seen some of them, like the AHA video. Mm. And uh, I thought that was the one that made me realize AR is going to be huge, mm. to see that great video from the 80s where the cartoon is trying to fight his way out of the comic book pains. Uh, how big of a player is Apple going to be in all of this? this? Apple doesn't release a developer kit like this to this kind of fanfare lest they have, I think, a serious interest they don't release a lot of products. So how much is Apple going to be a player in this future? Uh, and I think I think Apple and all of the, the big companies, um, you know, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, they all are very, very focused on, on error. Um, some more for the operating system perhaps and others for the hardware like Apple, I'm sure, or both. Um, I, think, I think all of them will be big players probably. Um, I think from my perspective, the more people who get involved, the more money that's invested, because in some ways the, the real money flowing into air that is accelerated at probably by five years started with Google's investment in Magic Leap, um, mm. or the, the, the other, the other the, leap, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, the other leap. Um, and that's true. Is that real, Magic Leap? Is that stuff real? Uh, well, you know, I, I think... You're it, smiling. I, I think <laughs> it, the, 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 the vision's real, certainly. The vision's real. And it's, I think... I think that like like any really hard problem and ambitious thing. Um, certainly, I would never I would never speak ill of someone for trying to do something hard or ambitious. Right. Um, and you're always one good serendipitous moment away from success. So right. uh, it's hard to it's hard to say. Um, the critique has been hmm. Magic Leap showed a huge box to people that would never in any reasonable amount of time be able to be worn on somebody's head and said, here is our vision, we'll get this down to the size of glasses. Do you think they can get it down to the size of glasses? When will we have AR small spectacle-like glasses? I think someone can. And whether it's them or, or someone else, they're, if anything, whether they are able to pull it off or not, their role certainly will have been triggering this fire mm. of investment from... Company, companies like Samsung and LG on the actual component side, all the Western companies, and that's good for us certainly because yeah. we want it to happen. We want these spaces where hands are most important to happen faster. Yeah, yeah. Magically, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get my hands on that demo because what I've heard the back channel mm -hmm. is the negative back channel is that they duped investors by showing them something that could not make it to reality, and then the defense of it was. Well, of course we're showing you something big that becomes small, just like every other hardware mm. device in history mm. has been large and clunky, and then Moore's Law happens and it, it works out. But it's, I guess the question will be if they ever are able to release a product and they've raised, I believe, billions of dollars. It's a lot of money, but you know, impossible is a strong word. And impossible is a strong word. Yeah. In our lifetime is a not a strong word. In a, in, two, in a decade or two is not. Uh, and I, I think I, I think there are people that are close to making the, that small. 
Um, hmm. Whether the specific technology they use will get there, hmm. um, whether they'll get there, but I, but I would say that you know whether they succeed or fail, that the the, the idea that the underlying technology can be small um, with the right combination of luck and, and money um, isn't isn't inherently fraudulent or ludicrous, probably. Yeah, it doesn't feel ludicrous. It just, you know, sometimes people, you know, if you were to say, I'm going to make a flying car mm. 20, 30, 40 years ago, it's a little bit preposterous, and people did make them. They just killed themselves in them frequently. <laughs> and now you see seven companies. I was looking at seven or eight different companies that are doing human-based quadcopters. Mm. I mean, in some cases, there are six or eight rotors, but essentially quadcopters, not drones with fixed wing, mm. but more you know, rotary based. Yep. And it does seem like that is not so far fetched right now because mm. I just saw the one that Larry Page, I think it's called Kitty Hawk. Mm. You see the video of the Kitty Hawk flying across the ocean or flying across a lake? No, but I can I can imagine. Literally there's a dude on top of a quadcopter mm. that was flying across a lake. Mm. And this is the one Larry Page put a hundred million dollars into, I heard. Uh, and I let's uh, Eddie Ed, uh, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie, let's let's make a point of getting a uh, well, Magic Leap won't talk to anybody. Mm. But we could probably get Kitty Hawk or one of their competitors to come on and talk about those videos. All right, listen. Michael, I, uh, I wish you all the success in the world. The demo is truly, uh, I mean, it's sincerely impressive, like to a level that I, I don't, you know, I've, I've never experienced and I've experienced a lot of the stuff. So you must be very proud of the demo. Uh, we are. It's, yeah. it's been, it's taken, a, it's taken a long time. All right, we'll get a card game going in there, and then maybe if we can get a poker game going in there and you can deal cards, yeah. throw your cards at the dealer, be angry. You can cheat, yeah. Cheat a little bit. We trade aces <laughs> back and forth, trade cards. Um, that would be, we got, we got to get a, you got to get the next demo because once you play with that demo, I have to tell you, playing with blocks, that made me want to play chess. It made me want to mm. play badminton. And I played that game Rec Room on Oculus, and it was like interesting like to pick up the ball, but not like yours. Hmm. Without the controller, it feels so much more natural. So continued success with it. Um, how can people help you with your vision? Or should they be buying the dev kit? Are you looking for developers to start playing with this? Is that the key? Yeah, yeah so you know, for, for developers, uh, leadmotion.com or, or developer.leadmotion.com. And, and uh, you certainly anyone, especially with things like Unity or Unreal, can, can build content easily now. Oh, really? Get the VR. Unity engine... Uh, well, yeah, and, and in fact, I, you know, Unity and Unreal might be the the sort of decisive content creation platforms. If for sure, if if everything becomes three D in the future, certainly. Uh, it's amazing. I'm interviewing the founder on uh, next Tuesday mm -hmm. in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. They've been, it's been on the program before, but that that, that company is pretty incredible, huh? It, it definitely definitely is um, very. It probably has ninety percent. You know, market share for, wow. for VR. What is it? Unity is the other one? Yeah, well, Unity, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, not Unity. Yeah, um, yeah. Unreal. Unreal. Mm -hmm. The Unreal engine is mm -hmm. far behind it, but still yeah. interesting. It's probably 10% of absolute numbers, but it has some of the bigger developers still in the studios. Ah, right. Who are making like the Call of Duty type games yeah, yeah. or something. All right, listen. Michael Buckwald, if you uh, are... Thank you for coming on the program and sharing the vision of Leap Motion. Go to developer.leapmotion.com, developer.leapmotion.com, or Leap Motion. Follow Leap Motion on Twitter and continued success. And we'll be looking for Leap Motion built into the next generation of headsets, I think. Yeah, it's been great to be here. Okay. We'll see you all next time.